Lord, as we gather this morning in the name of your Son, we thank you that because he is risen from the dead, that he by his promise is here. Lord, by the stripes which wounded thee, from death's dread sting thy servants free, that we may live and sing to thee, alleluia. Open our hearts, O Lord, to your presence. Apply the power of the risen Christ to the deepest places within us. Open our hearts to your grace and to your truth. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I want you to know it feels a little audacious to be standing up here. And the reason it does is because it's kind of odd. And, and what I mean by that is this. Here we have, it's a packed cathedral, which is wonderful. And what that means is we've got families with kids who are hyped up on chocolate. Thankfully, they're away in the nursery. We've got husbands and wives that had fights with each other as they were making their way to church. We have some visitors who are trying against probably some of their best concerns about church, going to come here this morning just to see what it's really like. It's an incredibly odd mixture of people that would only be gathered in a place like this on Easter Sunday morning. It is a unique event. While the cathedral locals know each other and say hi and wave and talk to one another, we're much bigger than the cathedral locals, for which I'm very excited, by the way. And in the midst of all of that, this incredible diversity of people, I bear a very clear and yet daunting responsibility. And that responsibility is to take these ancient stories that many of us have heard for a long time, but some of us haven't heard in quite a while, and perhaps some have never heard before, and say them, teach them, talk about them, describe them in a kind of way that actually connects with what's going on inside of me, inside of you, inside of the people here. I say inside because if you look at what happened with Jesus and the resurrection stories, a part of what I love about them is that in the midst of this cataclysmic event that we're still talking about 2,000 years later, the thing that is so wonderful about it is that who Jesus actually appears to after his resurrection are not enormous crowds of strangers. He doesn't show up in the midst of Jerusalem, for example, and go kind of, aha, you were wrong, weren't you? Or to roam the seat of economic and political authority in the Mediterranean. He, he hides out, as it were, in Galilee, and shows up to very, very specific people. It's what Peter says in the Acts lesson that was read, when he said, but God raised him up on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses. And what gave them that right? To those who ate and drank with him. In other words, who did he show up to see? His friends. Including the friends that betrayed him. Including the friends that had run away rather than face standing with him in the midst of a trial that could have cost them their lives, too. And even Paul, writing in the Corinthian letter some years later, he says, last of all, as to someone untimely born, as if it never should have happened, and yet it did, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. In other words, the tender, lovely, powerful parts of these stories 
It's Jesus actually coming and connecting with very specific people. And my hope, my hope for this entire service for all of us is that Jesus would connect with us. In other words, with you and me as specific individuals. That if this is not a word to a crowd, this is not a liturgy for a crowd. It's a word to David, to Mary, to Daniel, to Paul, to Jacob, to Dan. In other words, people that Jesus actually knows and recognizes. Because he made them. Because he loved them. Do any of us qualify for that? Well, of course not. If you think you're if you think you do, you're in the wrong church. Because the real story is, just like what Paul says, I, I'm not fit to be called an apostle. All of us are in this place not because we have somehow qualified, but because God in nothing but sheer love and mercy, nothing but sheer love and mercy, chooses to say, come, come in, come sit down. That's, that's what happened to Mary. Do you, do you notice? I love this in this story. Mary is the one, Mary Magdalene, who shows up at the tomb first in the story. And what does she know? She doesn't know anything except that the tomb is open. The body is gone. In other words, except for a few linen cloths that wrap the body, the tomb is in fact empty. She has no idea why. In other words, so far there's been nothing that she's seen around angels and things like that. In this story, it's a little later. So what does she think or assume? The scriptures doesn't tell, don't tell us, but what I would assume is that she would think, uh, uh, somebody has robbed the grave. It was, in fact, you see, the tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. The grave robbers could have easily imagined that if we get this big stone out of the way, we can find all kinds of things inside that tomb worth taking. They didn't know it was nothing but the grave of a carpenter. So her assumption is grave robbers. She goes straight to Peter and to John. The body's not here. The tomb is empty. They don't know what to make of it. So they literally, and you can hear, the, you can see the concern, they're running to the tomb to see what happens. John gets there first, and he stands at the door, just staring. But he has no idea what to make of it. But it says he believes. Not that he believes that Jesus rose from the dead. That doesn't come until later. But he believes that what Mary said now is true. He's seen it with his own eyes. Peter blows right past John, goes right inside the tomb, and sees the same. And what happens? I don't know. What would you do? They, they go home. In other words, there's no resurrection. The grave has been robbed. And for them, it's just another piece of a story that they have known very, very well. A story of oppression. The Roman government. Soldiers were there. They should have taken care of it. They were not. Perhaps what happened was is that the grave robbers paid them off. They left. The grave was robbed. What are they going to do? Are they going to go protest in front of Pilate's palace? A lot of good that would do. So they just go home. You see, for victims of oppression, whether we're talking about the oppression of a nation, whether we're talking about the abuse of an individual and the oppression or the oppression of a family, a broken system where violence and degradation is just normal, for them to suffer this way is to use the euphemism, just another day at the office. Another indignity suffered. Quietly, as they've done plenty more times when they've seen things that they have hated or had it happen to them. 
Anger is turned into resignation. Just endure, just get through this, is what kicks in for someone who's been beat up like that. It's what one feels when a son has been hit by his father. Again, it is what one feels when a wife has been struck by her husband or her lover. Again, it's what Christians feel as normal life in many, many parts of this planet, including the most recent events in Kenya. It's what any marginalized people feel when normal life means that they are treated as less than other people. Try not to think about it too much. Endure the disgrace. Keep the depression in check. Act like everything is just okay on the outside. Even if there are no bruises, it doesn't mean that the heart isn't crushed. Just keep going. But what if Mary, Magdalene, See, they can go home to families. They can take up fishing again, try to forget this horrific several days that they have endured. But Mary had no place to go, not that we know. Where was home for her without Jesus? The men could go back fishing. What was she to do? She fell into grief, weeping, the kind of weeping that cries out hopeless weeping because there was nothing left to do. Broken, empty, heart-sick, hopes dashed. But look what happens. Angels. But a certain kind of tender appearance. There's no terrifying bolts of lightning. Just the quiet presence of eternity. Notice the angels are sitting. There's no command. There's this they understand it's pastoral. They connect with the very deepest grief that Mary is feeling. Woman, why are you weeping, they ask. And there's not a hint of accusation. You've heard accusation. What's wrong with you? Why are you crying? There's no hint of that. Why are you weeping? And it was just enough to draw Mary out of the solitude of her grief they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Notice, she calls him my Lord. He, he was her everything. And just as she says that, there's Jesus. And what does Jesus do? I love this. He calls her name. Something deep stirs within her. She knows exactly who. My teacher. She runs to him. She wants to hold him. She says, and he says, oh, not yet, not now. Go to my, notice, my brothers. Not those cowardly disciples who all left me when they should have stood beside me. It's religion that wags the finger. Jesus never does. Not once, ever. Go tell my brothers. And off she goes. Something new has happened, and now it's here. It's us. We're also listening and wrestling to the story. This extraordinary story, where in the resurrection of Jesus is Chris Russell, who heads up this amazing organization called the Church Army. It's a service to the poor. It's evangelism. He says the seemingly unbreachable distance between God and death is now collapsed. Jesus has invaded hell. He has conquered death. He rises victorious. All of a sudden, the whole landscape on planet Earth feels slightly different, deeply different for those who call upon him. So much so that even death itself is nothing that we're to be afraid of anymore. You remember St. Francis, and he writes, And thou most kind and gentle death, waiting to hush our latest breath. Oh, praise him, hallelujah. Thou leadest home the child of God, and Christ our Lord the way hath trod. Hallelujah. The most feared enemy of all, death itself, that stops human life in its tracks. It seeps out of us, the best, the 
capacity for laughter. Nothing before us but literally hollow emptiness and the fear of hell itself is now gone. Broken. We are invited no longer to see death as an enemy, but literally to see it as an invitation, an invitation to come into the place of life. Because what Mary knew when she heard the name of Jesus speak to her is the very thing that we hear. Because we know that when she heard him, she knew that she would be safe in his arms. That in the midst of a host of unanswered questions, where would she go? What would she do? That moment, all she needed was to hear her name. And she knew that everything else, everything else, no matter what it was, even if the worst were to have happened, if the Roman soldiers would have showed up in that very moment and arrested her on the spot and condemned her to death, she knew that in that moment Jesus would not forsake her and she would literally go to death singing. That's what happens for people who know within the depths of their hearts the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Something is changed inside of them. It's never merely thinking about somehow the fact of the resurrection. It is an encounter with the risen Christ. You can come here and be a part of the service and celebrate in a commemorative manner the resurrection of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that you know in your own bones, in the deepest parts of who you are, the powerful resurrection of Christ at work in you. That's why the prayer, Lord, by the stripes which wounded thee, from death's dread sting thy servants free. What? That we may live and sing. That's the mark of the people who know the risen Christ. There's a song that God has birthed within them. There is a kind of joy and a kind of courage that causes them to rise up and to live with a kind of poise, a kind of dignity, a kind of purpose that only can be given to them from God above. Human self-effort won't get you there. And in fact, if you're the kind of driven perfectionist that most people are, who live in this self-effort mode, the very efforts that you make to improve and to try to make your life better only create the gap inside of you between who you would like to be and who you are only wider. And so what do you do? You play the part. You learn skills. You're competent. You can get things done. People think well of you. But there is inside of you a kind of inner gate that tells you every day, even if you wish the voice would stop, that accomplishment does not satisfy the heart. And that all of this driven striving it can increase your paycheck, get you a better place to live. But it doesn't satisfy what's in here. It takes the application of the risen power of Christ to break into those places because what is material? It's just going to die. It's going to run away. It has no eternal value in it whatsoever. Accomplishments within a generation will all be forgotten. Maybe if you have kids, they'll tell stories about you. And not always good ones, by the way, remember? So if those are the places where somehow you're wanting to place your hope, you're just done. It's fruitless. Even the siren humanistic call of making the world a better place, as wondrous as that is, does not satisfy the deepest need of the human heart. Because God has formed us for a purpose that is, in fact, eternal. Eternal. Which means God has for you, if you are willing to say yes, something that he wants to do in you so that he can do something through you that actually makes an eternal difference in the lives of other people. Where in the midst of the courtesies, the kindnesses, the generosity, the sacrificial giving, the commitments to make the world a better place, life pours through. Something eternal gets imparted. It's like the very thing that happens when Jesus speaks the name of Mary. Any human being could have said the word, but when Jesus spoke it to Mary, something happened inside of her. Power got released. It wasn't merely the human recognition of someone who loved her. She was buoyed by it in a way that literally changed the course of history. As she went running back 
to tell the apostles who were still hiding out that they that she had seen the risen Christ. And it is because of her and others that we are here. You may think that just the saying the name is an increase of all things. Like the grain of a mustard seed. But small things given in faith in that desire to be that vessel through which God blesses other people, those things have great power. Great power. And it is all because of the very same Spirit, as Paul says in Romans, that raised Jesus from the dead, if you name the name of Jesus, is dwelling in you. And if you desire it, you can be one of those men and women, wherever you live and wherever you are, who can be a vessel that God uses literally to shape human history through the generosity and the kindness of the servanthood, through the willingness to live not for yourself but for Him, through the willingness in the midst of the failure and brokenness that all of us know and live with, that there is in fact a power working within us that is greater than anything that we could ever ask or imagine. And the wonder of it is that He never lets us go. As one Christian put it, for even during those numerous moments when I lost sight of my calling, even when I had given up, I knew there was someone that had not given up on me. To say he is risen is to know that no matter what is pushing me down, Jesus is raising me up. And that I too, as well as you, can be safe in his arms can know that no matter what we face in life, that we'll be held, that we'll be kept, that we will be strengthened, and if necessary, we'll even be able to sing, even in the face of death. Oh, my prayer is that today you do not just come to commemorate, but that you say yes, to the power of the risen Christ applied to the deepest places within you. The caves that are still filled with fear and brokenness and shame. Things you wish weren't there, that you kept hoping, even praying, that they would go away, but they have not. This is what the resurrected Jesus does. He opens the tombs. He cleans out the darkness. And he brings us the things that we have always longed for, but never knew how to ask. Peace, forgiveness, poise, purpose, power. If that's what you long for, please do not leave this morning without receiving. Ask that we might be in this city among our friends and family, people who are marked by the power of the wisdom.